Hi everyone, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today um, I'm going to do a lecture on the Spanish-American War. Um, okay, so please go ahead and take notes on this, and let's get started. So, got to move that. Uh, from the 1500s with the voyage of Columbus that really opens up North and South America to Europeans, uh, to the end of the 1800s, Spain had a huge empire across um, primarily Central and South America, but also into the Pacific and then into Africa as well, right? So you can see all these green areas, right? But by the end of the 1800s, the Spanish Empire was really waning. Most of their territories in South and Central America had gained independence, and really they were left with some smaller islands like Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines um, out of this huge empire. Um, Cuba was one of Spain's earliest colonies. It was one of the first, it was um, actually one of the first islands that the conquistadors had landed on and taken over, um, and it had remained Spain's colony all the way up until the 1800s, or until the end of the 1800s. However, Cuban rebels had been fighting Spain for independence throughout the second half of the 1800s, really starting around the 1860 time period, um, and have been unsuccessfully fighting for independence from Spain. Um, and just remember that Cuba, geographically, is extremely close to the United States. It's only about 90 miles off the coast of Florida, um, and it's also the biggest island in the Caribbean. Uh, so it's um, very significant geographically for us, which is why we kind of come back to it throughout Euro U.S. history. Right? We'll revisit it after World War II and during the Cold War as well. Okay, so... Uh, to support the Cuban rebels, in 1898, President McKinley sent the USS Maine, a warship, to Cuba. Um, it docked in the harbor in Havana, of the capital of Cuba, and on February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine exploded. Um, it was, at the time, it was unclear why the USS Maine exploded, and it's still unclear. We're not really sure. There are some theories that it was um, the uh, ammunition that exploded. There are some theories that the harbor was mined by the Spanish. There were some theories that it was sabotage, um, or it was the Spanish deliberately exploding the USS Maine. Um, however, at the time, many, especially Americans, believed that the USS Maine um, was sabotaged or destroyed by the Spanish to basically try and stop the Cuban independence movement. So here's a song that was published and widely circulated in the U.S. Um, after, right after the explosion of the Maine um, and before the declaration of the war. So there was a lot of kind of propaganda um, going around about uh, Cuban independence and particularly about getting revenge on the Spanish uh, for the explosion of the Maine and the death of some sailors, right? Um, so they call Spain two-faced butchers, et cetera, um, wave the starry flag, uh, uh, things like that. So definitely some propaganda around that. So, after the explosion of the Maine, President McKinley basically asked Spain to essentially um, give them something in return for the destruction of the Maine. Um, so, the first was compensation, money, right? The second was an end to the concentration camps that the Spanish were putting Cuban rebels in, right? Um, he said, hey, you got to end that. Um, a third was a truce in Cuba to end the war between the Cubans and the Spanish rebel, or the Cuban rebels and the Spanish fighters. And then fourth, and probably most audaciously, was basically he says, no, you have to give Spain Cuba, or Cuba Spanish, in, ooh, losing that, you have to give Cuba their independence from Spain. And part of this was because, and the reason he felt comfortable for asking this, was because of the Monroe Doctrine, which we looked at last time, right? So the Monroe Doctrine said that the U.S. would not allow European powers to interfere or to colonize in Central or South America, right? We basically considered it our backyard. So by asking for Cuban independence, right, um, the President McKinley was basically enforcing the Monroe Doctrine, saying that, hey, we're not going to allow a country in our backyard of Central and South America and the Caribbean to be ruled by a European country. 
Um, Spain agrees basically to all of the demands except for Cuban independence. They say, yes, we'll pay you for the main, we'll end those concentration camps, we'll end the fighting, but we're not going to give Cuba independence, right? Um, McKinley decides, okay, they're not going to agree to my demands, and Americans want war, they want revenge for the USS Maine, so we're going to go to war. Um, and Congress authorizes war against Spain, right? So according to the Constitution, Congress, Congress is the body that gets to declare war, so they declare war against Spain. So the war begins, uh, the Spanish-American War begins on April 25th, 1898. Um, it lasted only 114 days, so it was a very short war. Um, and it often was referred to by people at the time as a splendid little war, right? It was short, there were not a lot of American casualties, and we won, most importantly, right? Um, the biggest battle was uh, the Battle of San Juan Hill, which helped America kind of win the whole war. This was kind of the decisive thing. And it was also a notable battle for several other reasons. Uh, one, it was participated in by Teddy Roosevelt and his unit of soldiers called Rough Riders, right? And this really um, prompted uh, Teddy Roosevelt to become extremely famous, right? Again, in this model of American military heroes. Um, going into the presidency like George Washington, like Andrew Jackson, right, and then like Teddy Roosevelt as well. Um, the, so the Rough Riders were volunteer cavalry. They were um, horse soldiers, right? Almost none were professional soldiers, and they were led by Teddy Roosevelt, who was also actually in the government at the time. He was, in fact, the Secretary of the Navy at the time. So an acting government official is going and fighting the war, which was pretty unusual. Um, and they were a very famous, like, group of soldiers as well. Um, and then the Buffalo Soldiers were the other famous group. These were veteran black troops. It was a black um, a contingent of soldiers, and most of them had served in the Civil War. And they really thought of themselves, and a lot of um, Americans thought of them, really as freedom fighters, people who had fought for their own freedom in America, and now we're going to Cuba to fight for Cuban freedom from Spain. Um, so the Battle of San Juan Hill was unusual because it included this mix of professional soldiers, of volunteer soldiers, and black and white soldiers, whereas the military at this time was very segregated. There were black people in the military, but they were segregated from white people, and most of the times they didn't fight together. Um, but actually, in this battle, they did fight together. Um, and they all fought for the U.S. and for this kind of idea of freedom. So it was a kind of... a a significant and metaphorical battle, right? Um, and the U.S. won it. So, um, after just 114 days of fighting, the Spanish general surrenders on July 17th, 1898. Um, and after the surrender, the U.S. hops over and occupies Puerto Rico, which has also been a Spanish colony, on July 25th. So very quickly, we stop up another one of their colonies. Um, there were about 60,000 Spanish dead due to this war, um, and only 6,000 Americans dead. And the vast majority of those Americans died from disease. Only 374 actually died from the battle. So in terms of like, you know, battle casualties, we definitely really succeeded, right? This was very, very successful for us. Um, we occupied Cuba, we occupied Puerto Rico, only a very small amount of soldiers died um, from battle, and um, we defeated what had been a major European empire. Okay, so uh, Spain and the U.S. signed the Treaty of Paris on December 10th, 1898, which ended, officially ended the Spanish-American War. And in this treaty, we got um, several things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> I confused myself there. Um, so first, however, uh, even though President McKinley wanted to annex Cuba and make it a part of the U.S., because much of popular support for from America for the war had been based on the idea of getting independence for Cuba, it was kind of politically impractical. So even though at the, at the Treaty of Paris and at the signing, McKinley really wanted to make Cuba into a U.S. territory, he wasn't able to do that. 
Um, Cuba was actually granted to the Cubans. They were technically, in quotes, independent from Spain, but they were still a U.S. protectorate, basically meaning they had their own government, the Cubans had their own government, but the U.S. was also part of their government um, under their control. And basically, Cuba was not going to be allowed to do anything that the U.S. disagreed with, right? Um, which was a big benefit for us. We basically extend our power into the Caribbean and into Central and South America. Big negative for the Cubans because they don't actually get independence, right? They were not an independent country. Um, and in the treaty, we also annexed the Philippines over in Asia, Puerto Rico and Guam from Spain. Puerto Rico and Guam remain territories of the U.S. to this day, and the Philippines was a territory of the U.S. up until um, after World War II. Um, and in return, the U.S. paid um, Spain $20 million, which when you consider how much territory and power, um, political power we got from this is a very small amount of money. So the success of America in the Spanish-American War really signaled the entrance of the United States onto the world political and imperial stage. Although we had already started extending our power, particularly out into the Pacific and, you know, up into um, Alaska and out to Hawaii, um, this was really the signal that we wanted to now compete with the major European imperial powers, right? Um, Kind of at the same time, um, also Europeans are doing the scramble for Africa, right, where they're kind of taking over African countries, right? So this was kind of our way in participating in this um, political and imperial um, contest, right? Um, so by winning the war and taking the last of Spain's colonies from them, we essentially defeated what had been probably the most wealthy and most powerful um, European empire for a very long time. And it made a clear statement that we were ready to compete with European powers um, for political, military, economic power, right? Um, so this was really our signal that like, we're done with the civil war, we've solved, in quotes, our issues, right? Um, and we're ready to go out there and be part of kind of the global um, elite, right, essentially. Um, and the Treaty of Paris gave the U.S. control over two of the largest islands in the Caribbean, as well as the Philippines, which were a very, very significant gateway to Asia in terms of both military power and trade power, right? From the Philippines, if you think geographically, you can easily go up into China, into Japan, into the Koreas, into Indonesia, down to Australia, and then out into the Indian Ocean over to India and in the east side of Africa, right? So it's very significant to us to be able to control um, that territory. Okay. So, however, the success and the annexation of the Philippines sparked a new question, right? We had just essentially fought a war for Cuban independence, so what were we going to do with the Philippines, right? So after the end of the war, the issue of what to do with the Philippines was really hotly debated. It became really like a political hot-button issue. So in the next assignment, you're going to look at this question, look at some documents about this question, and form an argument that supports a one of three options, right? Annexing the Philippines, giving the Philippines back to Spain, or giving the Philippines their independence, letting them become an independent country. So you're going to go look at that and the consequences of the Spanish-American War. That's it for today. Thank you so much. Let me know if you have questions.